What's up, everyone? It's um, Thursday night. I have new internet right now. And my... Uh, it's, it's not um, as fast as it's going to be because I have to get a... Uh, I have to get a Wi-Fi card, but uh, my speed has changed. Check this out. And I noticed this when I just did, because there's upload involving, involved in going live here on live streams. And um, um, so I went from AT&T to... Uh, to Xfinity, so my download speed went from 28 megabytes per second to 341. And my upload speed went from 6, uh, 6, 6 megabits per second to 40.8 megabits per second. So, and this is not even as fast as it's going to go. Um, that is ridiculous, but I, my, um, for some reason, my ethernet cable is not working that well, but I've got about a, a 30 upload right now versus most of the time I'm at about five, believe it or not. And the cost jump, no, it's no, no more cost. Um, it's, it's crazy. I don't know why we didn't do this before. Uh, oh, thank you, everybody, for the uh, for the, about the piece. Um, <laughs> so, when I finished the video, I uh, uh, the video was about twenty five minutes long, and I thought. Okay, I have to edit things out. So I just started cutting things out of it. And a lot of the stuff that I cut out were, 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 was my critique of postmodernism because um, I had some examples in there. Uh, and, and then I've, I realized that I would get dinged for copyright. And... Um, and... The video is um, um, the video is the fastest growing video that I've had. Um, I don't know about Cat Six. I have the fastest Rick. I have the fastest internet uh, that I can get here where I live. So. Um, Uh, Lance, just send me an email. I'll send you the. I'll send you a. Uh, send me an email with your with your thing on it. I'll I'll, uh, I'll get you sorted. Um, <clears throat> thank you everyone for the for the compliments. I appreciate that. It's um. Uh, by the way, Garrett, thank you for asking. Aunt Penny is doing okay. She's in uh, she's in rehab. She fell and broke a bone, and but she's doing okay. She's she texted me a couple times this week, so um, um, my email is rickbeato one at gmail. I say it in every single video. Uh, and Penny's okay right now. Um, so. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate that. Good morning, Robin. We'll absolutely do absolutely tell her. Um, po postmodern in music is really it's not it's not really like the the it's not the same as the philosophy. Postmodern philosophy. Um, It's almost like a catch-all. Hey, Peter, how are you? For um, 
a lot of the really unmusical modern classical stuff that you hear, these unplayable pieces that are be, not only unplayable, but they're unlistenable. Um, post anything is lame. There you go, Dean. Um, she's doing okay, Peter, Aunt Penny. She's hanging in there. Um, so I feel like that was the first video I've done in a long time that is like my old videos. Um, and I'm very happy about that. I have the same, I had the same feeling that, um, yeah, Concerto for Piano and Chainsaw, there you go, exactly. Um, I got the same feeling of that from making that video as I did from my early videos, first year of doing, um, of doing this. And, um, you know, if you can't describe what you're doing, and this isn't about music theory. This is about, um, this is about taste as much as anything. I mean, I pretty much, when I work, when I come up with these pieces, I pretty much just improvise until I come up with things. And I, and I, um, and I, I, um, I figure out how to, Put the things together, but I want the things. I want them, you know, a, a piece like this. I want it to be exciting. You know, when you hear a Liszt piece or a Chopin piece or a Beethoven piece that that has some, you know, credible flourishes. Um, yeah, you want it to be like that. That's what's missing. The things that are just. You know, they need to be exciting as well as melodic. And uh, they need to be rhythmic. And, and um, I was thinking a lot about this term dissonance in terms of... Um, uh, I, I talked about it at one point in the video where, um, where ways to create excitement and you have... Um, And you have, you can do th in rhythmically through odd meters and accenting. You can do it uh, in register, tessitura, you know, or, or, or range, playing in extreme ranges of an instrument. That's a way to create, um, that's a way to create excitement, right? You can do it through melody, um, through, you know, odd intervals, things like that, or odd or dissonant notes against the chords, and you can do it in the harmony, right? But uh, I, think, I think the register thing is the one thing that people leave out. Um, I'm trying to... Uh, I'm always trying to, to, when I write a piece, I want it to, uh, I want to use the range of the instruments, you know? I think it's uh, that the, 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 the timbre aspect, the, 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 the range. Um, it's amazing when you see people improvise. Um, even the greatest improvisers, Keith Jarrett, I don't know if I've ever seen him play the C8 in a piece. I don't see him play down really low. Brad Meldow, I don't see him play the whole range of the piece. They're, they play in, uh, uh, they play in, the, and they play in the mid range of the piano. And, uh, 
Oscar Peterson uses the full range of the piano. He's one of the few, you know. Iden obviously uses the full range of the piano, but but uh, John Coltrane used the whole range of his sax. So did Mike Brecker. The you know jazz players like that. I mean, they 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 go as low as they can. They go into the altissimo. Um, Brett, we are tonal creatures. You can't escape it. Even if you try to take it out or brain search for it, I totally agree. I had one. Um, I had one thing that that um, that I took out of the video, and it's this. I think I took it out of the video. I can't remember. I, th I'm, I think I took it out. That. Did I take the, Did I play guitar in the video? Yeah, Matheny uses the entire range, right up to the highest note. Uh, listen to his solo on It's For You off uh, As Falls Wichita, so, so Falls Wichita Falls. But if you take it a string and you divide it in half, you get the octave up. Then, then you get the fifth. Then you get two octaves up then. And right there we have, there's no guitar in the video, I took it out. You can't escape the fact that they're in the overtone series inherently is um, is a major triad. Well, if you go one one more note, it's out of tune a little bit, but you give a dominant seventh chord. And once you have it, once you have a dominant seventh chord, that tritone, right? wants to either contract or expand, right? So right there is music in a nutshell. Music is meant to be, to, to have, uh, I mean, you can fight it all you want, but if you're blowing through a tube, if you're playing on a string instrument, you can't you can't escape the uh, the overtone series. You just can't. If you're living in our atmosphere, you can't escape those chords. Those things are just they're just built right in, you know. And I don't care how many pieces for chainsaw and string quartet you write. Uh, you know the chainsaw is creating a lot of noise, and it's just covering up. What's what's inevitably there, those uh, those those chord progressions, right? Um, so, um, the idea though that to, that I tried to get across is um, is that. Um, so little of tonal music has really been explored. People think, oh, it's all been done. Well, it's not been done. When I, um, I mean, without even getting to microtonal music, Renzo, I mean, that, we don't even have to talk about that yet. Just talk about tonal music. I did that one, put the little example there about ultra Phrygian, double flat three, double flat seven from the double harmonic major scale. You know, this People don't know about these scales. Um, um, really, it's it's. Um, I mean, there's just so much stuff, and using uh, you know polytonality even like I use it in the piece, but I'm I think I think I'm using it in a very. Uh, like I played last night, a very melodic way, you know, kind of um, um, where it sounds natural. Uh, that's the only thing I can uh, I can think of. Um, so, is it true everything's been done since Mahler? No, no way, not even close. Everything has not been done. Uh, um, no.
right? Uh, I haven't played that in 30 years. Um, you want, wonder if these people don't have great ears. I, I, that's what I think, Brad. I think they don't have great ears. Uh, it's really interesting reading the comments. Somebody says, you don't know what postmodernism is. You keep he, one of the comments said you keep saying postmodernism, but I don't think you know what it is. And I said, actually, I don't say postmodernism once in the video. I say the term postmodern one time, but that's it. Deb, will I be posting the video of the... Okay, so I'm actually, right now, as we are speaking, I'm converting it into uh, Final Cut Pro so that I can realign the audio and the visual. Um, the last piece I played was a tune by Pat Metheny called James. Rick had no beard, but really weird hair. Very poofy. Um, did Pat ever get back to me? No. Larry Carlton never got back to me. Pat never got back to me. Um, Deb, you can nominate me for a TED Talk. I'm, I'm, I've been waiting for somebody to nominate me for a TED Talk. <laughs> I'm really digging that I got this pick. I love the scratchiness. Heard back from Guthrie. Um, I think I'm going to see a lot of people. You can use the edge of a pick, Layton, of a regular pick. Here's a, a pick that I have that actually has the, the, the thing on it, but this is rough too, but it just. It just doesn't do it like this one. This one is amazing. So that's the pick right there. It's a Hermid pick. It says West Germany. They're a buck a piece. Uh, but this edge, that's what he uses. Uh, 
Any chance of having good Rick on? You know, Pete, I haven't talked to Mick Goodrick since 1987. And um, I, um, I knew Mick very well and hung out with him a lot. He was my teacher. I'm wondering if he would remember me. I bet he would remember me. He would definitely remember me. Um, but it's weird that, that I haven't talked to him in 30, in over 30 years. You enjoyed it when you told everyone how Pat used the back of the pick on Courts were great effect. Knew that nugget. Um, can I still play classical guitar? Uh, I'd have to grow my nails out. I could still play, I'm sure. Um, but I wouldn't play. Uh, play that though. <laughs> Came on two days in a row. Two days in a row. Um, so when I started working on this video this morning, I uh, I started it at 8 a.m. I was down here with a cup of coffee. I did not eat anything. I had about three cups of coffee. I did not eat anything until 7.30 tonight nothing I wasn't going to leave and and get something to eat until um, my, this video was done and I'm very glad it's done but as soon as this thing is rendered though I'm going to um, thank you Monty this is the new internet service. Uh, Brad, what are, you, what are you asking about which video clips? Oh, where are the video clips from? You're talking about the old, old ones? Um, they're from all different things that... Um, uh, there's some weird... There's just me hanging out talking to my students on, on my old... Uh, um, it's, it's very weird. It's, I have to go through and, and line the stuff up, but I'm complaining. My, uh, Tom caught me complaining about students in there, about my students, um, about they don't, cause Jocko had just died. I, I want to say when this was made and I was really pretty, uh, pretty upset about it. Pretty bent out of shape. Uh, and, um. Oh, Highway and Trees from the uh, new video? That's from my my video stash that I have. Pat's asking me if I humidify my guitars. I don't actually humidify them. I have a humidifier. Um, and I should. There's, there was a... There is a crack here. It's been fixed, but uh, I, I can feel it. It's actually... Um, the, the seam has definitely come apart a little bit. Um, but I should probably use some, um, uh, a humidifier. It's pretty uh, stable in here. I mean, we've had so much rain. Oh my God, it's pouring out today again. 
It's supposed to rain the next four, four days or so. Is the gamer happy with the internet? He's totally psyched. He's totally psyched. He told me that, um, that there's a lag, um, that he's getting 18, uh, 18 millisecond lag, Dylan was saying. And, uh, and I said, well, what's it normally? He said, well, with the old internet, the fastest it ever was was, was a 40-second lag. And he said sometimes there would be a 400-millisecond lag or something like that, which is insane. That's when he would be complaining all the time. Um, the lag is what makes or breaks champs. That's, I think that's true, Jay. Um, you have a home technician, right? Exactly. Dylan knows about all this stuff. It's pretty hilarious. I was like, Dylan, hey, you got that hooked up? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I got it. It's all, all sorted out. Okay. Um... So, do you guys notice though my that I use two different cameras in this video? The um, my Sony camera looks amazing, but everything comes out green, and I have to I have to do color correction on it. Um, I really, uh, I really, um, you talking about in this step that the white point of light? I noticed that when I go back like this, there's a weird white point of light comes on the screen. Yeah. Um, I don't know why. I don't know what that's from. It's some weird reflection. Green equals fluorescent lighting. Is that right? Do I white balance? Peter, I don't even know how to white balance. So I asked Rhett, and Rhett said, we well, just need to take some green out of it. He kind of showed me once. It's on my, um, it's on my Sony camera only. My, um, my Canon camera, the coloration is beautiful. You see the spot? Is, where is the spot? Like sometimes, it's, I, I noticed it last night. Um, it's only, it, it sometimes happens when I lean a certain way or whatever. It's really weird. Um, see a lot of brown and beige, I know. I'm wearing this, this thing like a jacket because it's, it's cold in here. Um, You don't see it now. When you, when I lean back, it appears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I noticed that. I'm not sure what that what that is about. Photographers use green gels to fill flash when shooting under fluorescent, then shift the white balance. Okay. Um, you know, I have to actually watch some videos on this. I do have to watch some videos. Um, I'm gonna be back tomorrow with a Beato um, with the uh, Beato Club live stream. Um, and I'm going to have the Keith Jarrett lesson up, which I'm very excited about. It's, uh, it's very involved and, and it's nothing that you'll find anywhere because it's, um, it's a, um, it's a trans transcription of one of his sax things. I want to play something right now. Can I, can you guys give me a second? I want to turn off these lights in here because it's really um, bothering me and it's probably bothering you guys. Like this light is, I know that. And then the ones that are pointing right in here, I can see, hang on, because they're bothering my eyes. Hold on. So about two years ago, when I first started my channel, I've mentioned it on here. Um, and um, oh, you notice my new lounge in the background. Yeah, so I got my lounge. I got a chair. I got a couple chairs down here now, which uh, I'm going to move that one against the wall. That's a spot. I just have to move the stuff behind it out of the way and it'll go against the wall. I want to have some places to sit down in here. Those lights bother you. Good. Yes, they bother me too, Deb. They 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 actually drive me nuts. Uh, 
So, so I want to uh, play this Michael Brecker, Klaus Ogerman piece. I, um, um, no, I haven't gotten any, if I got any new guitars, no, not really. The only new guitar I got was the, oh, I, you know what? I got the, that Rickenbacker bass. That was it. Um, uh, Cityscape. Thank you, Brett. I want to see if it gets blocked right now. And I don't believe it's on... Um, Klaus. Klaus Ogerman. Cityscape. Here we go. I found it. Hold on. I have to say that is probably one of the most beautiful pieces that I've ever heard. Beautiful f sections of a piece I've ever heard. Beautiful improvisations. I don't know if that's the melody or not, but um, that is just unreal. So I did a video of that really early in my channel, and the and the audio was taken out of it, and it was blocked. And that city, Cityscape by Klaus Ogerman with Michael Brecker playing the saxophone. Um, so I'm curious to see if they're going to block it again because that was over two and a half years, that was over two years ago that I did the video. Um, let, let me play that little section again because it's just outstanding. <laughs> up there so um yeah i think it's improv there I, I really do um so i in my video i told tell the story about um meeting mike brecker at avatar in new york city and um I met him 
walking down the hall and I said, I was shocked. Hey, you're you're Mike Brecker. And he kind of looked at me weird and just kept walking. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. And I said, and, and he was very rude, I thought. So if, I know some of you heard, heard the story, but I'll tell it for the people who haven't heard it. So he was in the C uh, studio at Avatar, and I was in the D studio. They're bo- both upstairs. He was making a record. It was, must, must have been the first day. And I was sitting in a lounge, and about an hour later, he came, came walking back over. And he said, Rick, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, um, would you like to come in and listen to, to some something. I said, absolutely. So I walked down the hall in the studio with him. I remember it like it was yesterday. Walked into the control room and he was, the engineer and the producer were there and, uh, and Mike. And, uh, so we're talking, he said, uh, this is my friend, Rick. Uh, you want to play him? Uh, let's, let's check the, check the track out. They were playing a I want to say it was a minor blues or something. And um, it was Elvin Jones, Matheny, uh, I forget, uh, Oregon. Well, whatever record came out in 1999, I'm sure you guys can find it there. And, um, and he asked me what I thought. And I said, and for those of you hearing this story for a second time, um, I said, well... I don't know why I said I said it sounded amazing, but the Larry Goldings, okay. I said it sounded amazing, but I feel like the compressor's really clamping down when you go up to Altissimo A flat, right? And and he goes, "That's exactly what I thought. I was thinking the same thing." And the um, and uh, he said, and the, the producer gave me the the death stare. Maybe it was the engineer. I can't remember. Nobody likes to, you know, once something like that is put on a recording, it's uh, it's very hard to, uh, there, well, there's nothing you can do about it. So uh, from then on, for the next two weeks, every day, he'd come over. Rick, come on over. Then the next day, Matheny and Elvin and all them were coming in. And Mike came over and got me. And he's like, let me introduce you to the guys. And... Um, I came over and he introduced me to Matheny and Elvin Jones and I and he said this is my uh, um, he, this is my friend Rick, he's working over in Studio D. Hey, great to meet you. I would met Matheny probably ten times then, but he doesn't didn't remember. Um, Elvin, I had never met. I met Ron Carter on the same day. He was working downstairs in Studio A. This is unbelievable. It's 1999, New York City. You know. Uh, 20 years ago. Um, so I talked to them. I talked to Mike every day for about two weeks. And and uh, we exchanged phone numbers. And I told him I was a producer. And he said, do you ever use saxophone? I said, yeah, I've used sax on, on sessions before. He said, well, um, he said, please keep me in mind in the future, I thought, I'm not going to hire Mike Brecker to come in and play with some crappy band. I mean, he played, I think he played on Big Ten Inch with Aerosmith. Um, he played with Joni, uh, Shadows and Light, right? And um, so a few days after we left, I got a call. Rick, Mike Brecker. Hey man, when is your how'd, how'd the record turn out? Because he finished. I actually finished um, after they had left because I was there for a month straight, and I was just sitting in a lounge. And this mixer, Kevin Shirley, was um, was trying to resurrect this disaster of a record that we had made. And um, so when I heard Rick Mike Brecker, it just kind of blew my mind. And he said, uh, I, I seriously, you know, he asked me about how the record was going. I said, well, and I told him how bad the, the um, how bad the thing had gone. Yes, Caveman, GDK, Caveman Kevin Shirley. He was great. Loved hanging out with him, man. He was, he was a blast. He, he's an incredibly talented mixer, producer, everything, too. Um, 
so Mike said, you know, really keep me in mind in the future if you need somebody to, for any, you know, session work. I said, cool. He probably figured, oh, here's a rock guy. The, the, you know, these guys are paying 2500 bucks a day. He's there for a month. He's thinking me, you know, he's, you know, I probably can hire him to do a date, pay him five grand or something or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but he wasn't like that. I mean, he was absolutely so nice. And um, when he got sick, it was really, it was really uh, sad. They looked for a donor. Um, he had a rare genetic disease that people of Ashkenazi Jewish descent were the only people that would have been um, bone marrow donors, apparently. Um, I don't know what it was. Peter, if you're on here, I don't know if you know what Mike Brecker had, uh, what disease he had, but they could not find a... They could not find a bone marrow donor that was a match for him. And they advertised all over the world. Um, and... I don't know if it was a blood disorder, if it was, uh, um, if it was a type of leukemia, MDS, IBJ. Is that what that is? I don't know what that is, but um, he was sick for about two years, and then he did the record um, uh, leukemia. Okay, then he did the um, that f five seconds to midnight record. According to um, my myelodysplastic syndrome, my myelodysplastic, my, I, yeah. Um, but they put it out all over the world. They they put out a call to on his website to try and recruit people to you know. Um, it's. It's, um, you know, I think he died in 2009. You thought, Peter, you thought it was, he had lymphoma. Um, I would bet, Peter, that you would know better than me, obviously, but um, I would bet that, um, was it pilgrimage? Uh, that now, in 2019, um, that you might have better luck finding a donor, uh, especially with things like, I mean, I don't know if, if I, I could be totally wrong with this. I'm just talking, you know, talking, but with things like 23andMe, people that know um, MDS is which is pre-leukemia. Okay. Um, Pat, that's what your mom has? That's crazy. Um, I'm just wondering if it would be... Uh, um, easier now to find a donor than uh, than it was then. I don't know. I don't know the particulars of it, but um, um, he must have started getting sick. Um, eventually, transforms into acute leukemia. Um, thank you, Peter. He started getting sick in in the. Um, I think he started getting sick in the early two thousand, in the mid two thousands. Um, 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 I talk of a donor. Anything. Um, Cornell has an amazing blood cancer division. Blood cancers are tricky. Um, uh, Eric, you lost a friend, Scott Enrique to leukemia. Join the Be the Match registry to become a donor. Okay, well, there you go. Okay, so there are things like that that exist now that probably were not in, def in full swing in 2009. You know, uh, people are a lot more aware and connected nowadays. Um... You know, it's it's absolutely terrible. Uh, 
he was so young, you know? It was really... Um, that one was tough. I didn't even know. I mean, I knew him casually, and uh, and uh, that was a tough one. Nobody plays like him. Yeah. You know, when I uh, when I was watching this video of myself in 1987, right after Jocko had died, um, it was pretty surreal because he was so young. Um, he was so young, and um, but but you knew that Jocko had problems for years. Oh my God, the stories. We all knew the stories, I, you know, in the 80s. I mean, Jocko's last healthy time was probably, I don't know, early 80s, really. And um, um, it's, uh, anyways, it, that was not a shock like Mike Brecker uh, because... You just knew something bad was going to happen uh, to um, uh, you, you just you just knew that uh, that something bad was going to happen to Jocko. I remember when I heard heard it, uh, and uh, it was it was you know I had heard all the stories of him sleeping on the street, breaking into things. I mean, all the stuff that you heard about in the documentary, you just heard. I knew people that knew him, you know. Uh, I think on this this video here is me and Emily Remler playing together. At least there's audio of it because Tom taped us playing in my apartment. Uh, speaking of somebody that, that we lost very early, you know, way, way, you know, 60 years before she should have at age 32. Um, but... He secretly taped Emily and I because I wouldn't let, I didn't want him taping us, and he did it anyways, and I'm glad that he did. So, um, uh, anyway, so, um, that was a tough time. Tough time. Um, Ron, there's, uh, there, you know, grief is the uh, only thing that, that helps is time, but a lot of things you just never get over. Um, you just, uh, you know, it's so hard. Um, by the way, you've been digging the curve record. There you go, doppelganger. Good stuff. Want to go back and listen to it again. Um, all right. I've got about one minute or two minutes left probably on my uh, on my video transfer or uh, importing here. My God, it's taken an hour um, to do this. Oh, yeah, let me see here. It says it's. Um, thank you, Jay. Um, now, oh, it's only nine, 91%. All right. Um, I better go here. I'm trying to make a, uh, an Instagram video of, of one of these clips of uh, uh from back in uh in 87 um so i got to i got to relax been a long uh been a long day today and i'm tired so you guys are the best i'm glad i came on tonight this is awesome i'll uh speak with you guys soon <laughs>